Sergeant. <laughs> but see, the problem was his last name was the same as mine. So I was already screwed. Oh, my gosh. The moment I showed up there. <laughs> it was, oddly enough, when you arrive to basic training, they start you off with something called, at least when I was in, shark attack. Okay. And that's when you get fed to the sharks. You get off the bus, they're screaming at you, put your bags down, all this kind of stuff. And it's pretty funny because we're here today. Welcome to the Tragedy Academy, a show created to bridge societal divides in a judgment-free zone using candor and humor with Jeffrey Heim, founder of Sharko. How you doing, Jeffrey? Good, how are you? Doing great. You want to go by Jeff? Up to you. All right, let's do Jeff, man. That's much easier. Too many syllables. <laughs> so Jeff went viral in May 2021, surviving an alligator attack, which I'm sure a lot of people raise an eyebrow when they hear alligator attack because you were diving for shark teeth. So how you doing? Great. Great. Tell everybody alive. where you're from, what you do, and then we'll kind of uh, get into these stories. I'm actually from North Georgia. Okay. That's where I grew up. And then I went to school. I went to college right over here in St. Leo. Okay. Central Florida. Uh, where we are right now, that's like 20 minutes away. Yeah. I say We have a, a friend that's a tennis coach there. Really nice. good guy. I, nice. He's also pickleball. I guess now everybody plays pickleball. So At St. Leo, that's new to me. I didn't know that. But I played lacrosse there for oh. four years. That's a brutal sport. A lot of people don't realize how angry those sticks are running around out there. Yeah, we get whacked the whole time. And I got whacked for four years straight in college. I've got scars from that, too. <laughs> so, North Georgia, mm -hmm. you go to school here. How do you get to Sharko? It's pretty crazy. I got by, by the skin of my teeth, honestly. But when I was in college... Same thing. I had a roommate whose dad's friend friend was this guy named Mark Rackley, who's a producer at Shark Week. Um, he's been a Shark Week veteran since pretty much the very beginning, worked on Jackass since they were Wild Boys and National Geographic Discovery Channel, all that stuff. Um, so like I said, my college roommate's dad's friend's friend is him. So my college roommate's dad was like, you guys should go visit. This guy, Mark Rackley, he's crazy. He's in the Keys. He dodged with sharks. And at that time, I was really into fishing. I grew up bass fishing in North Georgia. Okay, right on. I grew up on Lake Okeechobee. Um, bass fishing all the time. Lots I grew up in the bass, canals, yeah. around all the gators, everything that's in there. That's that's my wheelhouse. True. Yeah, a lot of people bass fish there. I've heard it's really good. Yeah. That's a massive lake. Absolutely. Just whenever I describe when people ask me where Okeechobee is, I'm like, just look at the giant spit mark in the middle of Florida. You can see it from space. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a loogie on the state. It's right there. <laughs> I've never been there before. I've always wanted to go um, for the bass specifically, but I've heard of some fossils around there too. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it's fed by the Everglades. What's not in there? Right. Right. There could be anything, literally. Um, but yeah, we went down to the Keys and at first, Mark Rathley wasn't too interested in me. I was just, you know, I had no experience relevant to what he does. But I just really wanted to swim with sharks. And it took a couple trips, but eventually we swam with sharks down there. And I got to know him a little bit better. And then I wanted to work on a fishing boat, basically for a career. And eventually I befriended his, his basically wife's son, who goes, his name is Steel Rock, literally. And he's one of the best commercial spear fishermen in the Keys. Um, and I was able to get on his boat and learn through the trials and tribulations of commercial spear fishing. A lot of sharks, a lot of hard work, a lot of fish, long days on the boat. And uh, I lived down there for a whole summer. So I got closer with Mark and eventually he invited me with his family to go dive for shark teeth in South Carolina. So we dive the Blackwater River there that does have alligators. We even did it for 12 miles free diving us together as a team. We literally dove 12 miles of that river looking for areas to find shark teeth. And eventually a couple days later, we found some. And I found like pieces of megalodons and pieces of angustitans, which is a megalodon ancestor. Oh, hooked. so the megalodon is said to be the largest shark in history, correct? Largest fish in history. Fish, okay, so it had its predecessor, is that possibly larger? No. So okay. uh, the megalodon is the largest. Right before that is chubutensis, which can still get like 50 to that 60 That sounds like feet. a diagnosis. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely, I got some chubutensis. It took me about a month <laughs> to pronounce that correctly. So 
the predecessors of Megalodon is Chubutensis, then before that is Ingestiodens, and before that is Auriculatus, and before that is Atotus Oblicus. Oh, Atotus so Oblicus whole... sounds like a, a spell on Harry Potter. It could be, yeah. <laughs> be careful with that one. <laughs> Pull that HDMI out, put it back in, see if that changes it. Anyhow, um, so you're in this river, you're diving for shark teeth. Is this your first time actually going in for teeth, or are you just doing the spear fishing and then you're going on to this particular portion? At this point in time, this was my first time diving for shark teeth. This okay. was back in 2017. Okay, so I can only imagine that it, we wouldn't be sitting here talking today if it didn't have an impact on you that day when you were in that river unearthing these prehistoric teeth and items from the ocean in shallow waters where nobody else would know to look. So can you tell me how that resonated with you and what made you go and just continue to a higher level? I just got hooked right away. Even the anticipation of that trip, I was just so excited I couldn't sleep. I knew it was going to be awesome either way. But when I actually found them, it was just something else. I'd never seen something so cool to me in that point in my life and I just wanted to learn how to do it more and more um, but at that time I didn't even know that I was near the shark teeth capital of the world which is Venice till I started reaching researching it and then I started making two-hour trips to Venice started sifting for teeth along the shore there along the beach and the first time I went um, I only found one tiny broken tooth after five hours of sifting and digging I don't think I could handle that Five hours, but we're talking about something that's called a passion, right? Right. And when we're doing something that doesn't have something that's coming to fruition constantly, we've got to have something within us that's telling us that we're fulfilling our dream in place. And it doesn't matter whether or not you find teeth if you're enjoying looking for teeth, right? I saw a meme a long time ago, and it was a miner, and he was underground. And he was mining for gold, right? And he quit. He quit, but you could see that the gold was just on the other side of the wall. Makes sense. Never give up. Yada, yada. That's the, uh, the premise. My takeaway from that is, if only he had loved mining, the gold wouldn't have mattered. If that makes sense. Oh, yeah. The patience is why I'm here right now. So I, there's been, I mean, times last week, this Sunday, I got basically skunked. Um, but there's a lot of patience that goes into it, a lot of hunting, a lot of scouting and learning. I'm always learning as everyone should be. And, you know, I do love the hunt and that's why I do what I do. But like you said, it's really about the passion. It has to be. And let's... Take it a step forward. You figure out that you're in the shark tooth capital of the world, right? And you have this new passion. You decide that you're going to go ahead and start doing this on your own. You're going to stand up an operation. You're going to get in the water and you're going to make all of these dives. And then suddenly something happens. You want to tell us about 2021? Yep. So actually, I had spent hours diving in that river earlier that winter with Mark Rackley, who I talked about earlier. and we would rough it out there. We would take out little kayaks, little dinky fold-up kayaks and our scuba tanks and look and explore and find new areas. And we would find teeth. I found my best megalodon at that time in that river. Um, but he he was a cameraman for Gator Boys for as long as they were around. And What was Gator Boys? Refresh my memory. Because I think it was like, a, it, was, it was wild as hell, wasn't it? Yeah. So Gator Boys is awesome. I now know... Uh, two of the hosts, both of the hosts now. And I went hunting with Paul Bedard, one of the hosts. I went for teeth with him last month. He took me. But they literally just catch and save alligators. So the nuisance alligators that would otherwise be killed, ah. they just capture them alive and bring them to their farm so they can live out the rest of their life and teach about alligator conservation and education. So it's really a great program. Um, but it's good because... The alligator population is no longer endangered. They've completely rebounded. They're endangered like in the 70s or 80s or 90s, but now their population is in is in good shape. But still, they save them. 
and they love the alligators and they feed them and they let them live out their life. See, that's super cool because we don't protect enough of our ecosystem here in Florida. This is the developing state of all states. I agree. Every two seconds, there's another strip mall, there's another yeah. neighborhood, there's another circle on the map from above that just completely taints the entire area. And I see that, but I live in one of these neighborhoods. But right. let's be honest, though, it's designed that way. Society is designed to find the affordable places to live and access to all of the care and amenities that you're going to need for a family requires you to what? Live in one of these boxes in one of these neighborhoods and off of the economy. That's the only way that we can survive. But we do have the ability to take a look at what's left and preserve that. And for someone like yourself, you have a really cool motto or mission with Sharko, and that's help ancient sharks save living sharks. Can you explain to me what you mean by that? Yeah, so all the shark teeth I find are between 2 to 23 million years old. They're literally ancient. They're fossilized. and I then put that energy towards helping save modern day sharks. So specifically around Florida, there's three main species that are endangered or threatened. It's uh, silky sharks, ha great hammerheads, and sawfish. Um, but across the world, there's a lot more. So I donate to uh, two shark conservation nonprofits right now. Uh, one is Saving the Blue, which you'll see a lot on Shark Week. Mm -hmm. um, I know the scientists there. And the second is Fins Attached. And they do more across the world. But I just think that concept is incredible. Just letting these ancient ancestors of today's sharks, a lot of them aren't even around anymore. They're extinct, like the Megalodon, uh, are directly helping their descendants today. Through you. Right. People like yourself. Um, I think that impact does ring throughout time. And whether or not that fish knew that it was going to have the <laughs> impact that it had, um, it did have enough to resonate with someone like yourself that saw that sharks are extremely misunderstood um, from what I've recognized over the years. The only time I've ever encountered a shark was off the east coast of Florida, skipping school and like my senior year surfing out off of the jetties out there uh, around like Port St. Lucie. Nice. And um, I was coming in and I remember the guy that was with me starts screaming, go, 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 go. And I looked back and there was like two or three bull shark riding the, the, the wave in behind really? me. Really? More than one? Yeah, it was not cool. And we just ran into the shore as fast as we could. I didn't stand up and do anything, just paddled like crazy. Dang, and you were splashing around too. Dude, huh? I had no clue what I was doing. I was on the world's like fat. Prey. I was a seal. I was a meal. Oh. I was everything. Dude, the only thing I wasn't doing was like wearing like a, a leathery looking feather suit. Like <laughs> <laughs> I was I was lunch out there. I don't know how I live, but you know what I was afraid of? Getting caught for skipping school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the shark didn't even matter to me. I was like, I'm gonna get bit. And then I'm going to get my ass kicked. And they're going to know, you're <laughs> they're gonna know that I was skipping school. Yeah, because you're going to be on the news. I couldn't even tell my mother about the traumatic event. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I, had, I held that till now. Um, we're here to talk about traumatic events. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but actually, you did have a traumatic event in 2021, diving these rivers in Florida. A lot of people don't realize that those are brackish. Is that the right word for it? It's kind of like a mixture between salt and freshwater somewhere in between and it's filling in it can be it depends on where you are in the river not where i was necessarily but uh definitely i mean every river at some point is practice right right so i saw the video obviously do you want to tell the story of what happened while you were in that location and um kind of go from there well i was just exploring looking for new areas that might have shark teeth or fossils and like i said i had dove this river many times before i'd spent hours in there even like at some points into the night and it's so dark, you don't even know it's night. So I remember one time I was on that river, you know, for an hour and a half under the water with the scuba tank and I come up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's nighttime. I had no idea. Um, but hyper focus is a bitch when you're doing something you're passionate. Right. About. Right. Yeah. I have, I'm, I have bad tunnel vision. <laughs> yeah. It's ADHD, man. We're all kind of in that scenario now because we've looked at social media on such a spin for so long that now we require hyper-focus to get things done. 
almost like we get annoyed with the outside world anytime it interrupts it. At least that's what's been happening to me. Yeah, me too, man. I'm completely focused on shark teeth and like I get hungry. I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta eat. Like I'm wrapping shark well, teeth knuckles. I'm either very passionate about the podcast and music or I'm autistic. So because <laughs> <one or the, laughs> I spend way too much time doing this. No, I get it. And I mean, that's what keeps moving the needle forward and turning into something that's better than something other people have that get distracted more often. So I love that tunnel vision. Uh, that's why I'm here right now. And, you know, it'll continue till the day I die. I'm very healthy. I work out a lot to literally stay alive as long as I possibly can to find hopefully the world record Megalodon. Now that's kind of a stretch. Like a lot of mega hunters will say, yeah, right, whatever. But that's really okay. The goal. So I'm going to go with the odds. How many humans on this earth are sifting through shark teeth? A lot, a lot more than you think. A lot more than I think. Cause I'm thinking still in the grand scheme of the billions and billions of humans on this planet, you got a much better shot of finding that larger tooth than you know, or that largest tooth than you know. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, uh, I guess doing it professionally is that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, yeah. So that's why I've turned my life into this career to give me more flexibility to go hunt Good. when the weather's right, when the timing's right. But still, there's a lot of other people doing it here in Florida. People are quiet about it because it's like the gold rush. Well, and it's funny you say that, right? Um, I went in, I did look at your merchandise and I was looking at the uh, shop. Uh, I did purchase a shirt. You got one of these. I did with, with the teeth on the back. Yeah, yeah you the saw Makos. that I ordered it this yeah. morning. These are real Makos I found. Oh, that's badass. When I saw the pattern, and I love your logo too. Your Thank logo you. is dope. You managed to get that into, you shoehorned the exact name into a very, very competitive area with Shark. S-H-R-K takes out all the bullshit. Right, Every. It, to me, it was like, wait a second, there it is. Like, I was looking for a new name. Uh, I originally started a small company, like in the very beginning, I had a partner. And uh, it was Jaws Apparel Co. Jaws Apparel Co. At the time, I loved that name. We loved the name. But he ended up stealing all our money, spending <gasps> it on himself. And I have everything literally down the line written out. I can see it. And he admitted to it as well. But it was a blessing in disguise. I felt Always betrayed is. at the time. but like. I wouldn't be here today without that happening. And I love my name. I love my brand. And I love the direction it's heading. Everything is a learning opportunity. Right. Because if you were to stay in that situation, you would have never had the product that you have now. You wouldn't love what you're doing. And on top of that, you know, people come in and out of our lives. And if we don't put any stock into anything but they're there for the moment and enjoy them while they're there, then we don't have to have some kind of remorse or regret after the fact, especially when we're passionate. Closer that you come to your passion, the further that people that are not in line with that particular way to live, they'll atrophy and fall off. You don't need fights. You don't need anything right. like that. Those people literally just fall off into the bushes like Homer Simpson or whatever <laughs> in that right. meme. They just you fade away. Yeah, They really do. And you know what's funny, though? I've found out, because we're all on the same trip, we're all doing the same shit, we're just doing it at different times and different cycles and different experiences, you'll see people pop back up. Yeah, They probably. come back oh, up yeah. on your radar later and say, you know what? That passion is my passion. I got, I lost sight of life. I started pursuing all the things that are out here that we believe will give us some kind of happiness. We were talking about earlier the, the Edward Scissorhands neighborhood where every house looks the same as the neighbor. Everybody walks in the door waving, hey, Bob, hey, Tom, whatever <laughs> it is. But behind that wall, it's a country western set. I say it all the time on the show. Behind it are piles of family. They're laying there crying. They're in pain. They're writhing from having jobs and doing all this crazy shit to maintain a facade and all this stuff. But then they get back up and they walk out the front door and they, Hey Bob, Hey Chuck, how's it going? <laughs> Nothing wrong here. Nothing wrong here. You know, and they just keep going on with their thing. But once they find their passion, right? It's like plumbing, unclogging a pipe, Un unclogging a pipe of greed or negativity or some kind of influence that's not yours. A goal that is not yours will clog a pipe. 
right? But the moment that you find your passion, that pipe opens up because it's just physics, man. Shit flows <laughs> towards open areas. You've been chasing shark teeth down rivers for a reason because it flows when there's nothing blocking it. The same thing happens with passion. Someone like yourself will stay underwater way longer than they should. How many times <laughs> have you checked and found yourself almost out of oxygen, not realizing you were almost out of oxygen? When I found, not, now these days, I'm way safer. I check my gauges all the time. <laughs> uh, I really value my life a lot more now. Um, I'm very, very safe and methodical now with, with that. Kind of stuff. However, when I found my six inch meg, which was just two months after I got bit, the six inch threshold is less than 1%. Wow. Um, and a lot of professional hunters, you know, or good shark tooth hunters search their whole lives and don't find one or don't find one full or, um, or one of good quality. So that's what a lot of hunters are looking for is that six inch bag. There's only Bro, I would be wearing that around my neck. I wanted to, but it's <laughs> like, what, like a flavor flame clock, dude. I, I would have it, that yeah. big ass megalodon tooth, yep. especially at like the shark tooth convention. I'd be walking through there, just looking at everybody. Like, this is my, my big old shark tooth. No, I'm kidding. Man. That's what I considered in the beginning. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you but should no, make it that spin. one's in a case. <laughs> Put it on a spinner. Yeah. But uh, that was, that tooth was just so large and of great quality and colors anyways that it just made the news anyways nationally again just because of the tooth itself not to mention the moment but yeah i still had my hospital haircut when i found that diving. oh so you're underwater you're completely zoned in or zoned out however you want to say it right because i'm watching the video i see your eyes peeking above peeking below peeking above peeking below and i understand this because we used to like hunt snakes and turtles and shit when I was a kid with Me halogen too. lights, right? Oh, because they cool. stick in the trees. Like, you just walk by and grab them. They're just sleeping there. As soon as the light hits them, you can see them. You just drop them in a pillowcase. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, it's fucking great. My buddy, Sean, the one that owns a turtle farm, he taught me that when I was a kid. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but as I was saying, so you're going up and down in the water, clearly engaged in what you're doing. All of a sudden, camera rolls. Yep. <laughs> Tell me about this. So what you're seeing from the camera is what I saw with my eyes until I get bit. So the camera's on my mask. The alligator bites my head and rips off my mask in the same first bite to my head. So I think the GoPro, which is hard in itself, and then I have an extra waterproof dive casing on it, which is even harder. I think that got, it did get in the way of the bite a little bit. It most likely saved my life, if not prevented worse injuries. Like I could face. see that because the front of the jaws is where the, the most pressure is. And if you got that GoPro wedged back in the back of the mouth, trying to close, you got a better opportunity of it not getting all its chomp down. That's true. Yeah. I, I, I'm just imagining the mechanism of not having that happen because my friends used to take us on knee boards behind boats and skip us across the lily pads because they thought it was funny. So we've seen yeah, a lot Florida of man stuff, right? Yeah, just completely dumbass stuff. I get tons of, I still get tons of people saying like, why in the world would you go in water in Florida? I mean, I know that river specifically is way worse when it, when it comes to volume of alligators. Like that's one of the rivers you really just don't swim in. But in Florida, like even that river, there'd be families swimming in it that live locally. Like locals go in the water in Florida. Was it around mating season? So that was <laughs> why I got <laughs> the So that trip. definitely contributed. It was May, it was mating season. So yep. that's another reason why I was alone. I was free diving. I was by a restaurant. So there's a chance that people could have fed the oh, You were a walking PSA for hunting shark teeth that yeah. moment. Yeah. I, it was I, the perfect storm. <laughs> that sucks, dude. And the reason why I ask this is because someone like yourself goes through a situation where they're facing their mortality all in the blink of an eye, but it's on camera. I talked to Gary about this in the fighting world. There are extremely heinous knockouts or situations where somebody is just blasted and they don't know even that they're alive. 
how does someone go back? Because you've had this video up so long and it's talked about so much. Are you able to watch that video or is it something that you prefer not to see and just kind of discuss it only? Because that's a that's an odd phenomenon to me. When I first saw it, I couldn't watch it. So now I watch it all the time. I've seen it thousands of times. It's, <laughs> it's your toilet but, video? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's past that. I, I just like, I know like every noise in it at this point. I've just seen it so many times. But when I first saw it, we didn't have that video for two weeks. It was lost. The camera was lost in the river for two weeks until NBC found it. And I was actually getting a lot of like backlash, kind of speculation that I provoked this attack. Um, it's just people, we didn't have video, we didn't have proof. <laughs> what were you doing? Like sticking your head in its mouth? Yeah, like, I, I, I feel mean, like provoking is an every, arm or a foot. I was getting every perspective you could think of <laughs> Florida about this incident. I mean, it went worldwide viral. So every, like, every perspective was guessing. And even the news started to almost victimize me. It was very close to that actually, or turning me into the, the perpetrator villain, of some turn, kind turning of, me into the yeah. villain. But um, yeah, when I first saw it after two weeks of finally, okay, we found it, we got this. Now I can prove my innocence to those who are accusing me. Um, I can't watch it. First, I was with this big YouTuber, Jack Tinney of Juke Squad. And uh, he went with me because he knows way more about PR and all that stuff. I'm literally doing PR on my own, like, Oh, yeah, I, scale, and I it's just, was doing the same thing with this show. I looked like, you know, a chimp with a computer and a rock. It was just not working out for me. So I can understand, it's especially stressful. in that situation. And I didn't know anything. I knew nothing. So I was trying to navigate the media all of a sudden, like with a black eye and huge swelling edema in my, in my face and headaches. Bro, your head looked like a railroad track, man. <laughs> <laughs> Put together by somebody that yeah, really is. It was yeah. a lot of staples. Yeah, I looked like baseball head. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had staples in my head once, but it was not from an alligator bite. I can tell you that. I slipped and fell in the back uh, warehouse at a grocery store I was working at on wet plastic and just cracked my head wide open. And I had to go on a date that day. <laughs> so I went to the emergency room. I was mad because they had to shave part of my head. Yeah, right. So it. they shaved the line. They stapled it. But my claim to fame is I went on that date. That's I good. did go, and I had staples in my hair and the whole nine, but I made sure I made it. Didn't work out, but I made it. To the <laughs> uh, but you hear those staples, huh? Right? It uh, sounds exactly like a stapler to the head. When like, they pull them out, though, it's like somebody itching something itchy. you could not very scratch itchy. for a long time. Yeah. It's a, it's like three prongs. Two go below, one go above, and it pulls the, it bends it that way when it comes out. But I remember like. Just wanting to scratch yeah. it all the time. Super itchy. It's like, have you ever tried to scratch your zipper? <laughs> it's not yeah. very satisfying. Yeah, no, I, I get that. It's Scratch your zipper. That sounds like something from when I was like 16. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I felt all 34 of those. Yeah, I get it. <sighs> 34. That's a lot of them. I want to go back because we started talking about your shop. And you said it's like gold, right? that other people are out there looking. And the reason why I bring this up is you brought up that six inch tooth, right? You do have shark teeth that you sell on your site for collectors or for people for conservation, things like that. And I saw that these teeth, the larger ones do fetch a pretty large dollar amount. Yeah, they're rare and they're hard to find. And we go through a lot to find them. I believe it. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not saying you have to justify the efforts to find these things. It's amazing that they exist and I would never go through the efforts to find them. I'm trying to say that that's a very competitive area. If people are really getting this much money for it, there's got to be a lot of very, very unique collectors that are in there digging around for this stuff. Yeah. It's a big niche, uh, believe it or not, but people that are in it in the shark tooth community know all about what goes on and everyone kind of knows everyone. So, um, but at the same time, it's not about the money for me, obviously, because it's a clearly, passion. clearly it supports your cause. Right. And, uh, my biggest motivation is also my collection. So my best teeth I keep and I will always keep and I'll pass down. Hopefully they always stay in my family, but I also sell 
like other people's teeth, like for the charter captain I work on. Oh, okay. No, I was thinking about like mouth teeth. No, not yet. Not yet. Like Joe's teeth. Like, hey, man, just throw this one in here. The rest of the shark ones. Just from sharks for now. (laughs) Although I get like horse teeth and croc teeth and (laughs) literally from the ice age. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. Now I'm, you're right. Everything is in the ocean. There's more ocean than there is earth. Yeah. So I get those on land. I get those in the ocean too, because Florida um, used to go 300 more miles of land. Really? Like when, uh, even when Native Americans were around, you can find artifacts 300 miles offshore. See, and we were talking about this before the show. I firmly believe that if we were able to scrape 12 feet of earth off the earth and silt, you know, sift through it, we would find the entire history of the world. We would connect all the dots. That's right. All the dots. But we have to get the oceans level too. 12 inches of earth from the bottom of the ocean yeah, man, as well. That would be crazy. We might find out things that we don't want to know. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. We would learn a lot. Yeah, we would learn that we've done this over and over and over and over again. Yeah, and to me, it gives me a good perspective on kind of where the Earth's heading right now and how quickly it's changing. Like, even the last 50 years, that's, you know, a millisecond in the Earth's time here, but it's changing very rapidly. You can't really deny that no matter what side of the fence you're on. Uh, The world hasn't artificially changed this quickly, ever. So that's just something to think about. It's something we should all contemplate because the earth is a gift. I'm not the most, you know, conservation friendly person. I have my issues when it comes to, you know, how I recycle and things like that. I can open. No one's perfect. No one's perfect. But But the earth of the macro. Yeah. The earth is a gift. Like we often overlook and live in two alternate realities that are not rooted in the now that's the future and the past we're not respecting the fact that we're here and that we have aptly called the present it's a gift and we have an earth that's been handed to us that produces anything and everything we need to survive yet for some reason we've found it necessary to pursue other weird occupations that are outside of what it is that we can actually do with what we have and just like time We don't respect the now. We live in those two other areas. We don't respect the earth either. We don't respect it at all. And it is a gift. It's only here when we're alive. That's all we know. And it's always now. So I feel like someone like yourself has recognized this and is using the past to help the future, just like you said, by doing a passion in the now. Respecting the earth in the now in those moments. We get very few mindful moments in this day and age, right? We give them all away. We give them away to Netflix. We give them away to Peacock. We give them away to video games. We give them away to music. We give them away to all these different things. But what we don't do is keep any for ourselves, right? We don't sit down and find the one that makes us who we are, unique. You're a shark guy. That's what we said all week. Shark man, shark guy, shark dude. That's what we said. But it wasn't in any way, shape, or form disrespectful. It was because you were cool. And we knew who you were. We looked at your videos, and you're not trying to sell people teeth. You're trying to sell passion and conservation and helping others. That's a big difference. That's why you'll be successful, right? And I think that we need to take a page from your book with regard to the earth. And if not for anything, at least be cognizant that it's a gift that we have. How disrespectful to be standing in greenery and thinking about something that doesn't exist tomorrow or yesterday. Like, why even be here? There's no reason. So I get a little deep every now and then. Sorry about that. No, that's good. I like it. It is deep. It's a lot deeper than we can comprehend, literally, the earth, the world. We think so, but I honestly believe that we're willfully looking away. Yeah, really good point. Really good point. Like lots of people, you know, don't understand it or think about it. Why don't you look at the homeless guy when you walk by him? Because then you have to admit how good you have. That's true. Shit isn't bad when somebody's sitting in shit in front of you. Yeah. Like, what do you have to complain about in that moment? But you're not going to sit there and look at him and talk to him because then what? Then you are no longer a victim. 
your victimhood is trumped. Nobody wants to stand around and talk to the guy that's in the worst fucking place because then they got to admit their place isn't fucking bad. I hate when people complain just in general. Just. Bro, that's a a profession. Waste of space, waste of brain power. I started thinking about how people interact with each other energetically. And I'm not a hippie by any stretch, but I started thinking about how people store anger, pain, and emotion. And what happens to them when they walk away from a situation. And we're like pinballs. We will take our anger, our situation, and apply it to somebody else as a valve, a release valve. We do it our customer service. We do it. Traffic is amazingly unbelievable with how people release their anger, expecting that somebody's not going to show up behind them at the next parking lot. You know? I got flicked off last week and I had no idea what it was for. <laughs> Some guy pulls in right in front of me with a cowboy hat on and gives me the finger. I was like, what? People are so upset for I no must have reason. been doing something, but I've know. never once in my life gotten into any bit of road rage. And that's amazing because I believe that we live in this part of Florida in an area that has some kind of bizarre anomaly where it's a boiling pot of water. And anytime you get in it, you're forced to be hot like everybody else. It's very hard not to take on what everybody else is trying to give you. Flying around you, slamming on brakes, over the top, just insane around here. And for someone like yourself, it makes sense though. You spend time with nature. You're not around this. This isn't your baseline. No, nah, it's not where I feel most comfortable. I grew up in the suburbs, basically always wanting to get more out in the wilderness. And now I'm in South Tampa, which is still the suburbs. And I'm just trying to do what I can eventually get out closer to shark teeth, more in nature and, you know, in a beautiful place. It'll happen. Just keep looking for the teeth. Right. If you <laughs> That's all looking, I got, man. That's all I want. If have. you keep looking for the teeth, the rest of it is going to fall into the background. You're right. Mistakes become background. They just become fuel. Mistakes are fuel for success every single time. You give me, a, if I build a table and it fucking falls over, I'm going to kick it into kindling. I'm going to fire up the fucking tool that's going to build me the next one. Like that's a badass part. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. I'm going to do something with that shit and it's going to create something for the next level. Like you can't sit around in it. Like you got bit by a fucking alligator, dude. Like (laughs) the only people that get to talk shit. And I read through the comment threads on your video, which I I apologize to you. There's some wild ones. There's some wild ones. But what really stood out to me was all the Australians that were a supporting you. And be talking shit because it wasn't a croc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot. Of- like, come on, man! You've never been bit, but you get to like by association in your geographic location talk about yours being more badass. Yeah, I see that specifically. <laughs> I love my Australians. Australians. Yeah, because of the crocs. So a lot from the Australians, I get a lot of like, why in the world would you go in the water? But. <laughs> Because over there, the crocodiles are way more aggressive than alligators. So yeah. it's more normal to go in the water in Florida in places that have alligators and swim in the same bodies of water as them compared to crocodiles, which are very aggressive. They'll even go on land. They know they can eat you. Yes. Alligators so aren't sure. Right. Which I don't understand. Typically, I hope they haven't they're still, figured it out. They're still each has their personality. And as they get bigger, they get more bold. And time of year obviously matters because I got bit in mating season, but still a lot of people every year across Florida swim in the same body of the water of alligators have no issue. Uh, like I said, I grew up kneeboarding and like Lake Placid, like Okeechobee, stuff like that. And there's tons of gators in there. I mean, it's it's where they all live in Florida. Right. And never had a single issue. The only person that ever gets the issue is the one that's swimming in mating season, saying, hold my beer, jumping out there. Being told they weren't supposed to do it, splashing around in the reeds, stomping on some gator eggs or, you know, ticking off mom. Usually or, there's a reason. Usually. Or they've been feeding it for X amount of time yep. and then showed up on day 37 without a steak. Right. So that's like. the that's a big <laughs> that's a big issue too. So feeding alligators. People don't understand, you know, it's awesome to see the alligator and watch it eat something out of your hand or a piece of chicken or something like that, but a fed alligator is a dead alligator, as they say, because it's going to hurt someone 
most likely it's gonna mm. eventually get removed. Um, however, in this case, my alligator was not killed by humans. It was not going to get killed. I immediately said, please don't kill it. I was in her home. I love alligators. I think they're beautiful. I think they're awesome. They're Amazing dinosaurs. creatures. Um, however, when she was being removed by the professional trappers who had to figure out exactly which gator did it, they trapped a couple smaller ones to figure did out. Did they interrogate them? Yeah. <laughs> like, I know you did it. You <laughs> bit him. It was you. Tell well, they, me where you were. <laughs> you actually have both Teeth? sides of the snout on my head. So you can see the size of the alligator because it. When is that getting tattooed? Doesn't need to, man. I got a no, big dude, scar. You need to like do a gator bite, like the whole chomp, like on the side of the head, like a like a Florida gator's helmet. You can see it when I get a haircut a little bit better. You can see both sides of the snout, and then I got a oh, bunch on the top. Your barber is like on an all terrain map. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I did get a free haircut. The first one after that, I had a weird haircut, still blood in my hair, dry oh. blood. But uh, yeah, it's it's like little trenches in there, dude. Because the side of my head was flapped open like a semicircle. Oh, not supposed to do that. No, I no. felt my hair over here where the headphones are. No, no, no. Yeah. Your hair cannot be in a different location. Yeah, it was weird. That's man. right up there with like a teeth nightmare. When your teeth like crumble in your mouth and fall out. You ever had that nightmare nope. before? No. Nope. Oh, it's horrifying. <laughs> teeth nightmares are the worst. And you feel like you're like, oh, you wake up and you're like, ah. There's like some kind of connection with it. But I can't imagine like feeling my hair in a disconnected area that's when i knew something was bad when i i felt that when i was looking at her and she was looking at me and then i had to dodge two more bites so one more bite she lunged at me and i was able to back away slowly and calmly like i had been trained with sharks and stuff calmly i, I stayed as calm You're as i am right now the top of your yep. head like a toupee that's glued to the side <laughs> This is not anything you do call. Well, it happened so quickly. The <laughs> reality hadn't set in yet, and the fear hadn't set in yet. There was no anticipation, which I think is more anxiety than trauma itself. Man, if you couldn't be more right, if it was going to happen to me, I want it to happen the way it happened to you. I don't want to know it's coming. Yeah, I had no idea. It was just out of nowhere. I thought a boat hit me. It was very strong, very powerful. Ripped me down to the left. I got bit, that bit twice. And then, like I said, I had to dodge two bites. The second bite, she really quickly uh, swam at me, and I could see her tail Yikes. go back and forth really quickly like they swim in the water, and I had to more do an athletic dodge there. I've got my long fins out in front, so they're a little more fast and powerful, so I was able to dodge that one, and then I just... Straight. Dodging with fins on does not sound like anything that I would be graceful at. Like, I couldn't imagine. I've tried to swim backwards. I am not good at it. I would be thrashing, screaming, everything in between. So lucky that thing didn't roll. So yeah. lucky that it didn't get a solid bite where it felt like it could hold on to you because that's when them jokers just go ape shit. Right. And any other inch in any direction could have been much worse. So like, yeah, she bit my hand, but she could have ripped that off. I could the shoulder, face, neck, any other appendage. Like I was just lucky it was in the hardest part of my body. Um, and not to mention that I didn't get knocked out even for like a second, even the smallest thing of just like having my first breath be air. Um, and then when knocked out of me, any other little change like that like concussion would have been a much worse situation. We're not having this probably, conversation. Right, right. So yeah, it was really just a one in a million shot of survival right there. Well, it's supposed to happen. Yeah, I guess so. So I, I mean, I felt you're not that. you're not here having this conversation and impacting as many, you know, parts of our ocean and ocean life and giving these positive impacts without having gone through this, right? So let's talk about going back into the water because there has to be a certain amount of anticipation going back into another river or maybe the same river. I'm not sure if you return to that one. But getting back into that kind of water that is murky and you can't see again, what was that like? I did head back to that river twice. Um, and then even two weeks ago, I was diving a deeper, darker river with more current in a different state for my fifth river I've ever done. But uh, back to the river I got bit in, I brought some extra defense with me. I brought Warren Sapp. <laughs> and, you brought uh, Warren Sapp? Yeah, yeah. Holy we went shit. Back my first time back. <laughs> um, Just, he, the gator's not going to grab Warren Sapp. 
right? He's a scary man. <laughs> he's big, I mean, he's a quarterback killer. But and two other better divers than me. So uh, all four of us teamed up. We had two boats. It was a much safer situation, better time of year. But still going back into that water was nerve wracking for me. I had a helmet on this time, but still uh, I'm coming up. I'm looking. I, I can only around, imagine. And I'm, I've always got that feeling of you never know when that split second is going to happen and your whole life can turn upside down. So I do dive with some of that feeling in my head now, but it's less than it used to be. Like that day, that time was probably the worst feeling I had of that. Um, and then when I was getting used to this deeper, darker, faster river two weeks ago, I had a lot more sort of anxiety to overcome. And then now I'm a lot more comfortable with it, but I still have to overcome that fear when I'm diving a little bit. But it's a lot more real to me now. I take it a lot more seriously and how I'm methodical with my gear and everything instead of just saying like, get me in the water. Like when I'm around there and like when I'm getting ready scuba diving and there's shark teeth in the water, it's like, how in the world can I get this gear on as quickly enough to just get me in the water looking at shark teeth? I could completely understand how that would happen. I'm the same way when it comes to making music or video work or any of that kind of stuff. I zone out, turn into a different human. Nobody can uh, disturb me. Uh, I would let cycles of the sun and moon go by without <laughs> realizing it even happened <laughs> if I didn't have a wife to grab me by the ear and say, you need to leave the studio for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that's real air. tunnel vision. It, but man, it's when you find that purpose, there's nothing else you want to do. Yeah. You are enthralled with it. You know, you were able to return to the water. And that makes me so happy for you because especially this is your passion. Um, a lot of people would take away um, a form of PTSD that may never let them return to the water. But you were able to take a look at the fact that the gator wasn't there then. It wasn't the same time frame. It's not the same place within the grand scheme of reality. That only can happen in that scenario one time. Right? We, talk, we talk about holding on to moments in our lives where something happened, whereas animals don't. An animal will go through something, and they'll keep it as a form of caution for the future. They might look out for something, but they don't take the identity of the situation and create a whole persona out of it and fear the rest of life out of something that really was a millisecond. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's speaks volumes for your mindfulness and your connection to nature to be able to risk going back in there and understanding that we're only here now, right? I just want to make sure you understand that that's, that's a beautiful thing that you were able to take that trust and faith in what you loved and put your feet back in there and do what it is that you were made to do. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good perspective. I've never really thought about it that way. Now, I do want to say about that river specifically is you can't legally dive in there anymore for unrelated reasons. Hmm. Um, more about digging the banks and, and stuff like that. But uh, I'm also not the only one to get bit by an alligator in that river. Hmm. Uh, I heard of one old fossil diver who got bit twice. And the second time he was like, I'm not going back in that river. Uh, there's a massive volume of alligators there. So um, it's like I said, I've been back twice. The second time I went with uh, Paul Bedard from Gator Boys, who's just, you know, completely professional and he was leading the way. So both of those times I was in a safer situation. Um, now it's my mindset is, okay, the more often I get into waters like that, the more likely my chances are of getting bit again. Mm. It is a possibility. I know it was like everything lined up, like with the mating season and everything, but either way, alligators bite and so when i say not happen again i don't mean by location or that particular mechanism or scenario i mean with the location of your plot within reality and life you won't go back through the exact same situation and to bear the pain of a past situation as a weight that you carry in future scenarios is putting yourself at almost a deficit for accomplishing what it is you're trying to do today um, Ernest Becker wrote a book, um, The Denial of Death, 
And one of the things that they he had pointed out in the book, I talk about it all the time, was uh, a kind of an anecdote or an analogy where if I put a plank of wood between you and I, and I said, walk to me on this plank, it'd be very simple, right? You can moonwalk down it, you can do a cartwheel. We're talking about a big old plank of wood, you know? Um, wouldn't have a single problem. But if I took that plank and I moved it 10 feet up in the air, same, so it's just as solid, just as stable, and I told you to walk across it. You're just as capable of moonwalking, cartwheeling, backflipping, whatever the hell you were doing when it was on the ground. But for some reason, at 10 feet, you're a completely different human. You have a completely different mindset. You're looking at the scenario. You have balance issues. You have instability. You have doubt. You have fear. You have all these things. But in reality, you're just as capable as you were before. So being able to step back into that river and not feel like you're on a 10-foot board with your arms out is pretty fucking badass. <laughs> But I like to point that out because we take on things that are not rooted in the now and make them a scenario that we need to navigate when, in fact, they're not there. They're not there. And I just appreciate that you were able to go through and continue doing this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have no choice. A lot a of people won't <laughs> understand that. A lot of people won't understand that. And I honestly feel bad for them. Not feel bad for them. I'm actually excited for them. Because I know that there will be a point where they'll be presented with the opportunity to have their passion where they would only do that and only care about getting that accomplished and people would come to them because they were doing what they love, right? So if they look at you and they don't realize, doesn't matter. It's because they haven't crossed that bridge yet or haven't had that opportunity. And one day they're going to go, shit. I should have been what I was supposed to do when I was a kid. We all know. You probably loved digging and shit when you were a kid. You were known for it. You probably had shit under your fingernails constantly. You know, and we know that we're supposed to be doing a certain thing. I talk a lot, love music. I was told to shut up, told that I sucked. Stuff like that as a kid. Didn't look back at it. Went through life, did different things. Suddenly figured out, hey, this isn't me. I'm supposed to be talking, I'm supposed to be doing shit. I'm not a corporate guy. I'm not this guy. I'm not yeah, that me guy, right? I'm this. And this is where I'm going to shine. That's where you're going to shine. Somebody else, they get to that crossroads. They're going to find their passion and they're either going to accept it and go for it or they're just not going to have the love for themselves to take that leap. And that Which risk, is funny. Yeah. It's honestly it's just risk. to be authentic. It's really not. Imagine walking up to a cliff with a blindfold on, but not realizing it was just a curve. Because authenticity is literally that far of a drop to just be yourself. It requires no work. But we will stand on that cliff. Uh, 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 uh. We'll comb our hair a different way. We'll put on a different shirt. We'll change our shoes. We'll fucking learn something so we don't have to do what? Just be our fucking selves step off the curb and move on. And guess what? There's a byproduct. The people you like will come to you. The other ones won't give a fuck. They'll be mad at you for a while. They'll be mad at you for one reason and one reason only. You represent what they're not willing to do for themselves. Simple as that. Simple as that. You are somebody's mental enemy. And not for anything but because you are pursuing your passion. When people start to hate on what I'm doing, what Gary's doing, what Caroline is doing, that's when I know we're doing it right. That's when I know that we are on a path for greatness, for success, for bringing people together. Because the moment that you hate me for what I'm doing, it means you hate yourself for what you're not. Simple as that. Just like yourself, pursue your passions. I genuinely appreciate you, man. I want to give you a minute to talk about your website, where people can find you, where we can uh, get some of these cool goods, man, because you've got tons of jewelry, tons of shirts, love your design. So I want to give you a chance to do that. But I just wanted to give you a chance, or I just wanted to say thank you, honestly, for having strength in your vulnerability. It means a lot, and it's going to set an example for so many more to get up and keep moving forward. Yeah, I appreciate that. 
So tell us where we can find you and, um, you know, what we can expect to get, you know, from your website and what you got coming up in the future. So my website is sharkco.com. I spell shark a little bit differently. It's S-H-R-K and then C-O, all one word. Uh, my Instagram is my biggest platform right now. It's at sharkco, same spelling. Um, but I make jewelry out of plenty of different species of teeth. So it's like different styles. Each person has a different tooth that they gravitate towards mm. and they choose from and they like to wear. So um, right now my most popular are bull shark teeth, the most common in culture. Mm. Uh, I wrap a lot of those, but people can get megalodon, necklaces, tigers, bull, uh, lemons. The tiger shark ones are really cool. They have that serrated side edge to them. Is yeah. that the... I was looking at that and then that made me understand. Like I I was like, well, holy shit, this isn't a pierce and pull animal. This is a shred animal. When it grabs a hold of you, it's got to be like ripping everything off. Yeah. And they're shaped like that um, to cut through turtle shells, which is a main part of their diet. So they also, when they bite, they turn their head side to side. So to cut like a buzzsaw. Uh, Each shark tooth shape has a different intention. Uh, like upper teeth are shaped differently than lower teeth and back teeth are shaped differently than front teeth. Um, so there's so much variation out there, which is why it's so awesome to me to find because you never know what you're going to get. And uh, also something I want to say is shark tooth hunting or that premise is very primal to us as humans. Even Native mm. Americans used to find shark teeth and turn them into necklaces and jewelry and even weapons. We find... I haven't found one yet, but we find like holes drilled in them for megalodons they used to wear. Uh, Genes like, and DNA are just code repeating right, itself. Right, We've right. got it in us. We so, know what we're looking for. Even like someone who's like a blueberry picker or just things like that, humans get really sucked into that because it's in our DNA as hunters and gatherers. So that's why people love fishing, people love hunting, people love searching for something and finding something that has a different result and an unexpected result. You get that dopamine kick once you find something that just surprises you. So that's what's kept me going. And that, I feel that very, that very primal experience. But that's why other people get obsessed with shark teeth and other people get obsessed with so many different niches as well. Um, and that's what keeps you going and keeps that thrill of that unexpected result. However, going back to my company, uh, I have a bunch of apparel options. I've got bathing suits. I've got shirts for guys, girls, kids, everything. Um, also, beautiful megalodon shark teeth on there. Um, oh yeah, they're dope, man. And there's some huge, crazy dude. ones. There's some crazy ones, but something there's something there for everyone. I believe it. Everybody should check it out. Um, ten percent of your profits go to marine conservation, correct? Correct. Um, everybody should know that. We're gonna have a link to all of your information where they can find your uh your video as well as where they can go and purchase and support your cause. Um, I can't thank you enough, man. I, I appreciate your entire passion, your lighthouse. Um, I say it to just about everybody that comes on here uh, for the simple fact that you're showing other people the way through your own actions and not by coercing or pushing people to find something. Um, you're just setting an example. And when we set an example, you know, we are a lot more impactful. Um, so I appreciate you. Thank you, Caroline, for bringing a great guest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So remember, everybody, be cool and keep learning.